We do know that it is business meeting night, and uh, Jamie and I have already talked. We know that we won't get get through this lesson uh, either tonight. Uh, we want to look at some uh, some things about the new heaven uh, and a new earth, and uh, it's pretty interesting the way that, that uh, the lesson is designed. But there's some stuff that we can look at tonight to kind of give us uh, an idea about how how things are to go. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 is a, a verse that uh, I've quoted a lot, and you all are aware of it. And uh, it says this, it, Jesus uh, has inspired through the Holy Spirit to talk to Paul. And here's what Paul said about this life and about who we are in him. He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if, if this is all there is, we are most miserable. Amen? Amen? Because we're surrounded continually by death and hurt and pain, even though we have Christ, uh, which is our great encourager. But if, if this life is it, we are miserable. Because if we don't have this second home to go to, then we'll be stuck here. But if we're stuck here after God redesigns things and God redoes the heavens and the earth, just like he did in the days of Noah, and uh, Jamie will be reading some of that for us to understand later, but uh, if we get if we don't get very far tonight, don't get upset. Just hang in there with it. We're going to finish the study. Uh, I, I think it lays in each one of our hearts. I tell you what, well, while, while I'm speaking, uh, just listen to Matthew 16 in the book. It, talk, it talks about a better place for us. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, there will be a perfect place for us to live in. There will be a place with no sin, no death, no sorrow, and we look forward to that place. But turn in your Bibles first to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, and it seemed like the closer we've got to the end of this thing, the more complicated some of it's got. Uh, and that's all right. That's why we're studying it here. So Hebrews chapter 11 is uh, it's called the Heroes of Faith. It's what it's called by, by many of us. And verse 13 talks about uh, that they all said, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them. And confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly country. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. And so... <clears throat> Just to get an outline of what's about to happen before Jamie, Jamie comes, I, I want us to look at something, and I handed some of you some cards. I'm going to take care of the reading in the book of Genesis, and you all are going to take care of the part in Revelation, but you're going to see what God's, God's intentions for us were from the very beginning and how things turned, and you'll also see how that God is going to change things. He's going to change the heavens and the earth into, into what he wants them to be, most especially together. So <clears throat> I'm going to read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and whoever has card number 1, you're going to read Revelation 21-1. So who has Revelation 21-1? Who has the first card? All right? Hang on just a second. So what you're going to see as we go through these, if you'll listen to them, you'll see a parallel between how things were created and what God is going to restore to her and what God is going to do. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, after I read mine, then you read yours. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And now read Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Amen. All right. And in Revelation 1, 16, whoever has number 2, you can read that after I read this. So Revelation 1, 16 says this. God made two great lights, the greater light, which he's talking about the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, which he's talking about the moon, and he made the stars also. 
Now who has Revelation 21 and 23? And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Anybody see what's, what's already going on here? What God's created, he's making better. He gave us the sun. Now we don't need the sun because of Jesus. Amen. Keep that in mind as we go through this these last couple of things. That no matter what happens, what change happens, we're going to be with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hang on to that. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 says this. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were the first day. So who has number three? Read that one. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Everybody see what God's doing? Amen. What's coming? All right, Genesis 1.10. I'll read that. Genesis 1.10, that's number four. It says this. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called his seas. God saw... That it was good. Now, number four. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. No more sea is interesting. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Maybe not tonight. Number five, which is uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 17. So the curse has come about after the sin from, from Adam and, and his bride. So the Lord God said unto the serpent here in verse 14, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. He, and to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Alright? Read number five. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Alright. Now number six, I've got Genesis 3, 19. It says, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. That means death. Who has number six? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. All right. The Genesis chapter 3, this will be for number 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden, we're talking about Adam, from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man... And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Somebody read number seven. And blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Amen. Good stuff. All right. Now, Genesis 3, 17. Whoever has number eight to follow up. And unto Adam, he, he said, Behold, because you hearken to the voice of your wife, we read that, but I'm going to read it again. And has eaten of the tree which I have commanded thee, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of all the days of thy life. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth of thee, thou shalt eat the herb of the field. What does number eight sound like? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Does everybody see the parallel between what God created and everything that man has gone through and is still going through to how he's going to change things back the way that it's supposed to be? Amen? Yeah. 
Amen. Come on, Jamie. You sitting on ready, waiting on go, ain't you, buddy? <laughs> huh? You got some of my verses, but I guess we'll read it again. <laughs> Can't read too much, can we? No, sir. There you go. Okay, we're talking about the new heaven and the new earth. And first off, we're going to look at 2 Peter 3.13. Peter 3.13 tells us, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there we have the promise of God that we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah. Now let's go back to Hebrews. We're going to have quite a few verses. Hebrews 1, I'm going to read 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So Hebrews is telling us right there we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth. It's like, like God is, is folding a garment. That's how easy it's going to be for God. And then flip over to Revelation 21.1, which we just read. We'll read it again. 21.1 tells us, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So he even revealed it to John. Now we got to stop for just a minute and remember where we're at, what has happened so far. We went through the tribulation, battle of Armageddon, Christ ruled on earth for a thousand years, uh, there was a final rebellion put down by Christ, Satan was cast in the lake of fire, the great white throne judgment has happened, and all who rejected Christ was cast in the lake of fire. Then he's going to do the new heaven and new earth. Amen. And Peter tells us how this will happen. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 10 and 12. It tells us, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. And verse 12 tells us, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved with the elements, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So Peter is telling us how it's going to happen. It's going to be with fire. But then we've got to look at what it means. Why, why will the earth be destroyed by fire that we just read about in 2 Peter? Now y'all going to have to stay with me on this, but I'm going somewhere. Let's look at Genesis 1.1. It tells us, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And there's your creation. Genesis 3.17-19 through 19 tells us, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is, the, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shall they eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So there's the curse. He's cursing the earth. And there's death entered. Now let's turn on over to Exodus. And I'm really going somewhere. It just takes a little bit to get there. 
Exodus chapter 16. So God has already cursed the earth. Death has been brought in because of sin. And I'm taking you to where God has took the Hebrew children out of Israel. I want you to see something. Verse 16, uh, chapter 16, the first verse says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. And when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger, then said the Lord unto Moses, and this is the important part, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. What God is doing there is trying to show the people to rely on God. Amen. This last verse here, he tells us, gather a certain rate. He didn't want them to gather a whole bunch because if you go ahead and read through the scriptures, it would be bad by the next day. Mm -hmm. so, so just gather a certain rate is what he's wanting you to do. Rely on God. Now if we'll flip on over in Exodus chapter 23. Let's, let's we'll look at uh, verses 10 and 11. And this is part of God's plan. So he's already wanting man to rely on God, on him. And he's got a plan for it. <clears throat> and six years shall thou sow thy land, and shall gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard, and with thy olive yard. So you see there, God has a plan to feed the people, to take care of the people. Yeah. You raise your crops for six years, let your land rest. And while, while it's resting, what comes up then is for the poor people and for the animals. So he's taking care of all his creation. Amen. If we'll just rely on him. But now we want to look at why the earth will be destroyed. God has his plan there. What has man done? Sin. You can see it today. Does he let the land rest the seventh year? No. He wants to make more crops, don't he? Plants it every year. Plants it every square acre he can. So the land's not resting. We have so much corn today, they're even using it to make ethanol put in our gas tanks. I don't think that was part of God's plan. Is it all because of greed to make more money? I don't know. Isn't that possible? You know, greed. What else have we done? We're putting chemicals on all our crops to get more out of your crop. Well, what's, what's that happening? It's running off into the land, into the water, killing fish and all other stuff, polluting. They're making equipment now where you don't waste much when you go through the field picking your corn and stuff. Used to, I remember, you could walk through a popcorn field and pick up quite a bunch of popcorn. Now you can't, you know. They're also changing the seeds. You can't, you can't take a seed anymore, hardly, and plant it from that ear of corn or whatever and plant it and get it to grow. It won't do it. They've changed it. You've got hybrid seeds now. Is all that for the greed of people? So they're changing God's plan. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 24.
Chapter 24, verse 5. It's telling us, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. <clears throat> so the plan, Isaiah is telling us here, the plan God had, we've broken, we've defiled the land. Look at the buildings they're building nowadays. Remember the Tower of Babel? The tallest building in the world at this time is in Dubai. It's 2,716 foot tall. That's half a mile tall. Trying to reach up to God. What are they doing? They're cloning. Cloning animals. Isn't that kind of like trying to uh, creation? Cloning animals? They're talking about cloning humans. But the laws won't let them yet. What about abortions? Sacrificing the babies. That's no different than when the Canaanites were sacrificing babies Amen. to Moloch. Amen. We're doing it again today. Now they're selling parts of the babies they sacrifice, they abort. Planned Parenthood is selling parts. People's getting rich off of it. What about sexual immorality? That wasn't God's plan. The homosexuals, same-sex marriage, wasn't in his plan, was it? Amen. So all this thing is happening on this <clears throat> perfect earth that God had created. Man brought the curse to the earth. Amen. Man brought sin. Man brought death. Man <clears throat> brought all these things I have just talked about. What about the heavens? Air pollution. Acid rain, satellites and space junk. It's not the way God created it, is it? These things are why God will destroy the earth and the heavens with fire. But I don't believe God will destroy them, and, and by that, that I mean take away and replace with a new one. I don't believe God will destroy it uh, and make a brand new one. I believe he'll change them and purify them. And here's why. The earth's God's creation, as is our souls. Didn't God create our souls? Yeah. When we're saved, he changes our souls, don't he? He don't give us a new soul. It's our soul. Let's look at 1 John. First John chapter one seven and nine. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he doesn't give us a new soul. He does, but he doesn't give us a new soul. It's still our soul. He just cleanses it. Now let's go over to Titus. Right behind Timothy. Because I have a hard time finding it. Go look at Titus chapter 2. Verse 14, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So he's going to, he cleanses and purifies our soul. He doesn't give us a brand new soul. It's still our soul, all cleaned up, mm -hmm. all cleaned up. What about our bodies when we get our glorified bodies? We don't get a brand new body. It's still our body. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting in verse 42. 42 through 44. 
And they're talking about our bodies. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Going down to verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earth, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Remember the flood in Noah's day. He destroyed the earth, didn't he? Yeah. He, he changed the earth, but it's still the same earth. Now, I believe that's what he's going to do when he destroys the earth with fire. He's just going to change it and purify it, bring it back to the state it was in when he made it. Warren Wiersbe says that when God destroys the earth with fire, Man's great works will also be burned up. All the things that man boasts about, his great cities, his buildings, his inventions, his achievements, will be destroyed in a moment of time. When sinners stand before the throne of God, they will have nothing to point to as evidence of their greatness. It will all be gone. Remember Genesis 1, 31? And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Amen. I don't think he's going to destroy his own creation. He does in our soul, and he does in our body. But I think he'll change it and purify it. Hope y'all find any questions. Hope y'all follow me. Brother Mike? All right. Chew on that just a little bit further. Get back into 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> to help understand what, what Jamie is uh, talking about, and like I say, we'll finish up uh, next week, but uh, go all the way back to what we started in on. Let's go all the way back to verse 3. Of Second Peter chapter three, it said, knowing this that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now here's a part that we need to understand, and I'm going to get somewhere with it, and then we'll close and get into business meeting. But he said, For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Okay? Y'all got that? Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Right? Yeah. It's still here, but he said it perished. The only family that survived was Noah, right? Yeah. All right? He said, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, was perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. There's a lot of ways to look at that one particular verse, and everybody has used it lots of ways. But a common sense way for me to look at it, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day, is simply for me, is that what it would take me a thousand years to do, God can speak in one day. What it takes a man a thousand years to accomplish, God can just speak it. Amen? Amen? Because everybody wants to get their calendar out and start figuring out how many 
days are in a year and then how many how many years we've been on earth and all that just realize that hey god created he spoke the world into existence yeah. with one word so yeah. doing what he does is, is no no problem but i want to get to something uh about the sea because we have people that are watching us tonight that may not know their lord and savior jesus christ uh think about this passage in, in the book of revelation think about how how uh uh, how, how John got to where he's at. And what, what's happened to John? He's on the Isle of Patmos. So when you're on an isle, or an island as we would call it, he's by himself. Right? It's just him and God, right? So he's been punished and taken away from everybody and everything else that he cares about. Right? Got ready for a nap? Some are shaking their head, yes. Some. He's by himself. So if you're by yourself and you're on an island and you can't get to those that you love and that you care about, what does that sound like to you? Hell. Hell. Sounds like hell itself, doesn't it? So God says, look, with you and your soul, the very thing that separates you from you and your loved ones, just like he did here. He said, I'm going to take away the sea. Does that make any sense now? I'm going to take the sea out of the way. I'm going to fix it to where there's no water between me and you. There's nothing between you and your loved ones that will separate you. I know this sounds a little bit confusing toward this lesson, but there's more to it here than, than a new heaven and a new earth. There's more here going on. This is also about salvation. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Look back at Luke 16, and we're going to, we're going to get to I hope it's in confusing about the lesson, but it's important... That everything that you study in the Bible always comes back around that God has a message about salvation. Always. So what happened to this, this uh, rich man that ended up in this place called hell? So he begs for mercy in verse 24. The father Abraham, he said, had sent Lazarus that he may dip his tip finger in water, cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that in thy lifetime. In other words, in your, when you had opportunity, you received good things. And likewise, Lazarus, he received evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And here's what I want you to see. If you're watching this via YouTube and Facebook, you need to hear this verse. Because this is why you need to accept Christ now. Amen. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Does that sound like the sea to you? There's a great gulf fixed. So that they which that would pass from, from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. So what God is saying here through Jesus Christ about this rich man said, look, when you, when you die lost, there, there's this gigantic, there's this gigantic gulf, this gigantic sea. You can look up that word; it'll tell you what that's about. There's a separation there; you cannot cross that. So, when you look at the passage that we've been looking at tonight about what's happened to, to uh, John in the Isle of Patmos, he's been separated from those that he cares about, and those that he loves. So, not only physically with this new heaven and new earth, but also spiritually, you and I. This, this gulf that's been fixed, those of us that love each other will, will be together. There will be no more sea. There will be nothing to ever keep us apart. That's part of his new heaven and new earth. He's taken away that sea. But I personally think uh, in, in that one verse that, that it's just also just a, a spot that God has just poured out his love on one individual that chose to listen to the Spirit of God and write the book of Revelation. Said, I'm gonna, this, this sea that you're looking at, I'm, I'm going to take that away from you. Amen? Yeah. Does any of that make any sense? We still got a lot of questions as we're going to next week? Yeah, probably so, don't we? Anybody got any questions about any of this before we dismiss? A lot of folks are yawning already, so we're trying to move on. Anybody got a question? Do you understand what happened with Noah? God said he destroyed it, but it was still there. He changed it, made it perfect. He got rid of everything except Noah and his family. He cleaned the earth with water. 
He's made a promise with the rainbow that he won't ever do it that way again, right? But now he's saying, I'm going to change this thing through fire. Somebody, before we leave, somebody that has your phone, look up and see, and I have no clue what it is. Let's see what the internal temperature of the earth is right now. See what the internal temperature of the earth is. I know y'all can do it fast. I've seen y'all operate within fingers. What's the internal temperature of the earth itself? 9,000 and 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that enough to clean Mother Earth up? Amen. Amen. God says I'm going to do it by fire. He fixes it from the inside out. Amen. Yes, sir, Jamie. Brother Mike, I didn't bring this out. I skipped over it. But if you look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, just what you're talking about. It says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, yep. reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. So that, he's telling you right there. That's right. That the earth is going to do the cleansing for Yeah. He's going to clean it up with fire from the inside. So all these failed folks you talk about, that this group's going to send an atomic bomb, going to bomb the earth and clean it all of it. And God don't need their help. Amen. God don't need that to clean the world up. God don't need anybody to clean your life and mine up, does he? How arrogant it would be for man to even think he could destroy God's creation. Bomb or not. Yeah. Well, he thinks so, trust me. Amen. Man, very arrogant, didn't he? Rodney, you got anything? You give me oh, that look. I just know in the Bible it says that if he didn't cut the day short, we would destroy ourselves. Yes, that's sir. why he's going to have mercy and cut the day short. <laughs> Otherwise, we would destroy everything on our, ourselves. Yes, sir. So I think we do have the capability. And ourselves, right? Yes, absolutely. That's why. Yeah, we destroy happen. ourselves. Well, we're already destroying the earth. Just a long way about it. And you can see that now. Us destroying our world. I can't imagine what this world looked like. I can't imagine what the United States looked like when Columbus came over here. Everything's pure and clean. And look at it now. Yeah, look at it now. Yeah. Which? I still just kidding. We gotta eat, you know. I tell you, no one had a boat when it came to flood. What's their boat gonna be when it comes fire? Jesus. We got Jesus. Jesus is our refuge. He's our. Cause that, that that's who we're with, right? So He's cleansing the earth. We will be in heaven. We're going to be with Jesus. He's making a new heaven and a new earth. He's actually making those two places one. That's where a lot of people get get, get confused. Where, where are we going to be? He's making those into one. Perfect. But the question is, where are we going to be? The same, uh, after Jesus has reigned, they let Satan loose, they, they've had the judgment. So all, then God's going to cleanse the earth. Where, where will the same be? Will we be in heaven? We, yeah, we, we'll this, be in that until heaven. This, and, and, uh, until this process is done. We, we, won't, you know, we won't suffer any of that. We're going to be with him. Remember, we come back with him as he, as he beats all of our enemies. And it says we come out of heaven to do that. And so it didn't like, we're not going to be destroyed in that process. No, but he, I'm just curious on where we're going to be hanging out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wherever that place is called heaven, until he cleans up and makes it all one, that's where we'll be. That's some thick stuff to chew on, ain't it? Yeah, because when you, as going through it and learning about the Bible, when you think new heaven and earth, okay, well, I'm die, I'm gonna, I'm saved, so when I die, I'm going to heaven. But then he's going to create a new heaven and earth, so who's going to reign on the earth and who's going to be in the new heaven? So you can see as a child, you get confused because you don't really know that he's going to make it one. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely going to do that. Well, also the heaven, I believe the heaven he's talking about changing is going to be the, the heaven we call our... That's, 
Yeah, yeah the, at the, the first heaven. Yeah. Let's clarify that. We're talking about the first heaven. Yeah. We're going to be looking at Miss Pat looking at me. You ready to throw something at me? She got her <laughs> arms crossed on me. Just in deep thought. There's a place that's called the, he the heavenlies, the heaven of the heaven of heavenlies. That's a, but that, that one, that atmospheric heaven, which is that first one, that, that's what he's going to clean up. Yeah. If not, we're just going to be floating around. There won't be a place to, to be. This is hard stuff to chew on. The easiest way would be to, to not set it out and just, just say, well, he's just going to make it he's all. And uh, just believe, well, yeah, I still got faith, but I like learning about it. So anyway, what anybody about, else? What does the Bible say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. I just think sometimes we just got to trust in what he's going to do. And, yeah. and I mean, not that we don't want to study. I understand that, but we just got to trust him and know that once we give our hearts to him, he's got it. Yeah, he does. He does have it. Yeah. And that, that's still, like I said earlier, every lesson we get into at the end of there's there's still salvation. That that's all that, that matters. That's all that matters. And that that's where that's why I was led to study out about, about that sea because that's the one thing that <coughs> separates us. Uh, even right now, it separates people from other people, doesn't it? Yeah. God said, "I'm gonna take it away." But then he goes on to say that we, we won't have a need for blood. Yeah, we don't. We won't have, and then we don't need the salt in the ocean because there there won't be nothing to be preserved. I know nothing, it's... nothing will spoil. Heard a whole lot of that. Heard a whole lot of them just like, yeah, as everybody's just saying, I don't want to, I, I, have, I, have, I have a good faith that it's just I'm going to be with Christ, so. But man, it sure makes you want to dig at some of this stuff. Uh, if you're watching tonight and you don't know Christ, you need Him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, we don't claim here to explain everything exactly right and exactly perfect. But if you're if you're not saved, then there's a difference between you and God. It's called enmity. It, it's a uh, it, it's an anger. It's a difference between you all. And you're the one that needs to make it right because you're like the rest of us that are here tonight. You've sinned. The Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And the greatest need you have in your life is to accept Christ. Do we understand it all here? No, we don't. But we have faith in God. Uh, and I have faith in his scriptures that I know I'm going to meet with him. And uh, you need him as your Lord and Savior. Don't gamble with your life. And for we believers, to go all the way back to what uh, Jamie was talking about earlier, when you read in the book of Exodus, I like that because he let them know I don't want you to store up enough manna to last you several days because then you won't depend on me anymore. Amen? Yeah. Are we doing that quite a bit now? No. We don't depend, depend on much on God anymore. We depend on our job. We depend on everything under the sun. Not that those aren't good things. And I'm just coming from a retired man and that I would I would call overtime I could get my hand up. Amen? Mm -hmm. there, there's also something greater out there, and it's Christ. Yeah. You need you need him. <clears throat> So remember that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna close with this just to kind of help solidify our promises here. Let me find it here. <coughs> My Bible tore all pieces, trying to keep it glued together. This is what I get for not marking it, Jamie. I'm going to get there.
know why you have to find it for me, your pastor's got a, his mind is shot. Where's, where's the scripture with the promise of our, of our mansion in heaven? Is that not in Matthew or is it in John? In John, isn't it? Answer my own question. John 14. I apologize for that if you're watching watching tonight. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am. Here's the answer to to Shannon's question, no matter where we're at, Jesus is where I am, there you may be also. That's the bottom line. Amen? Don't understand all of it, but where he's at, that's where I'm going to be. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for this night. Forgive me for my failure in your scriptures tonight. Oh God, there's so much there that we don't understand. But God, at the end of it all, as my wife said, we're going to put our faith and trust in you. And uh, God, wherever that you're at, that's where we'll be. But we thank you that, God, you are, you are uh, proven in your scriptures. Everything that's wrong, you're going to make right. Every worry that we have, you're going to fix. Every tear that we've ever had, you're going to dry up. God, every sadness we've had, you're going to turn it into joy. So we claim all these promises in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.